Good evening. That's pretty good. I'm Dino Dave, and we are wrapping up our creation investigation, Faith, Flood, and Fossils. Faith, Flood, and Fossils. Now, Bertrand Russell, famous atheist, defined faith this way. See what you think of this definition of faith. We may define faith as a firm belief in something for which there is no evidence. We may define faith as a firm belief in something for which there is no evidence. Do you like that definition of faith? No. Why not? Because there is evidence. Very good. We've been talking about it in each of our sessions. Yes, I would say this is actually a pretty good definition for insanity myself. You know, it's like something like, I believe the universe was sneezed out of the nose of a great purple dragon out there. We don't have any evidence of the great purple dragon, but that's what I believe. I would prefer to go to the Bible for a definition of faith, and we're going to start off as our jumping off place in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let's tease this apart for just a minute here. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Substance is a kind of a scientific word. That is, we take a pure element like hydrogen, we'll combine it with another pure element like oxygen, and we'll combine them together, we'll get something we call H2O, which is water. Water is a substance. So it's a very concrete word. It's a very, um, it's a scientific word. It, it kind of conjures up things that you could go in the laboratory and put your hands on. But notice this interesting juxtaposition, but it's a very concrete word. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. A hope is a bit more abstract. Somebody might say, well, I hope to win the lottery someday. Well, biblical hope is a little bit different from that. Biblical hope is a confident expectation. But still, it's things that you haven't seen. It's things that you are counting on being there by faith. And so here we have this interesting juxtaposition. And then it's, it's the evidence of things not seen. Now, we use the word evidence in the scientific arena. We've been doing that in some of our scientific presentations over the course of this creation investigation. But there's another arena that uses it even more. Who knows what that is? Yes. In a criminal setting, in the law, in the court of law, right? Both sides will present their evidence. And juries will come to some conclusions. And uh, you remember Sergeant Joe Friday, well, j the evidence, ma'am, just the evidence, right? Give, give me the facts, just the facts, nothing else. Well, what if, what if Pastor Nate was on trial, maybe because he had thrown a brick through my window because he was really angry at Dino Dave. And the, and the witness gets up there, and, and, and here's Pastor Nate, and there's his, his, his lawyer, and the witness gets up and says, I didn't see anything, I didn't hear anything, but as far as I'm concerned, he looks guilty. Now, if he's got a lawyer worth his salt, he's going to say, objection, I don't want your opinion on my client. Let's hear some facts. I mean, do you have footprints, do you have fingerprints, do you have, you have something you saw? And yet here we have this odd phrase, the evidence of things not seen. What's the author saying here? I think what's being communicated is this. Biblical faith is so strong that you could go into a laboratory and almost touch it. You could go into a court of law and you could bank your life upon it. That's the nature of biblical faith. It is not a leap in the dark. And God's not up there saying, okay, look, you take your best bet on a religion, we get up here, I'll, you, you find, find out if your guess is right or not. That's not what God's doing. God's given us abundant evidence. Evidence that he exists, evidence the Bible is his word, evidence that the, the gospel plan of salvation is powerful, even to the saving of souls and transforming of lives. We have evidence. 
But at the end of the day, God is not going to pop up, probably not going to pop up in your living room like a little genie and say, you know, here I am. You know, let me, can I do a miracle for you, you know, to, to, to show you I'm here? At the end of the day, it takes faith. Things not seen. Well, Hebrews chapter 11 then goes on to say in, in verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So the things which were seen are not made of things which do appear. That is, they didn't come from some former thing and evolve into how they are now. Rather, God made this cosmos, this world, the living things on it, out of nothing, poof, ex nihilo. We understand that by faith. And then fairly quickly, the author of the Hebrews moves on to a particular man of faith. In verse 7, we say, we read this, By faith, he says, Noah, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Noah is held up as this great man of faith. When nobody else in his community except his family would believe him, he persevered building this ark because of his faith in God and God's command. Did you know the Genesis flood, the whole story of Noah, is ridiculed today? It's become a focal point of geologists' attacks. Why are the geologists, modern geologists, secular geologists, evolutionists, why do they attack the flood account? Why is it such a big deal? Yeah, I mean, they want to prove evolution. Basically, if you look at it, this is the best evidence they have of evolution, is the fossils. You have, you know, the, the, the little invertebrates down here, generally toward the bottom, and then you have Nemo. Nemo occupies a very important part in evolution. And then along the way, you kind of start getting the amphibians, and then you're going to get some of the, the reptiles and up above. And by the way, you don't ever see it quite this neat anywhere except the textbooks. But, you know, you have this general order of the fossil record. And this was understood all the way back before Darwin. And that is their biggest evidence for billions of years of evolution. The geological layers, the supposed time that it would take for all these layers to be laid down and the discrete fossils that are in some of these different layers. And yet, despite it being this attack point, there is a universal flood belief in traditions and languages of every major nationality. The India natives, the Sioux Indians, the Greeks, the North Sumerians, Egyptians, over 270 people groups have a flood tradition, legend, belief, narratives that they, that they have handed down or, or traditions over many uh, generations. For example, the Hawaiians. Long after the death of Kunahana, the first man, the Hawaiians say, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. Isn't that interesting? He made a great canoe with a house on it, filled it with animals. The waters came up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Now, my friends, this didn't come from the missionaries. This was a tradition that the native Hawaiians had before the missionaries got there. This flood tradition. The Indians of Toltec from ancient Mexico said that the first world lasted 1,716 years, pretty close to what the Old Testament would say, and was destroyed by waters that submerged the highest mountains by 15 cubits. Only one family named Cox Cox survived. Well, they got the family a little bit mixed up over the years there. Perhaps the most famous flood record outside of the Bible is the Gilgamesh Epic. And this is a Babylonian record recorded on cuneiform tablets the Epic of Gilgamesh was found in Babylonian tablets, and it talks of Gilgamesh. He took his family of eight on a boat with two of each kind of creature and saved the world's creatures during the Great Flood. The story is so similar to the biblical record that skeptics of the Bible say, well, maybe the Hebrews stole it from the Egyptians, and they kind of stuck it into their Genesis account. And maybe the Babylonian, they stole it from the Babylonians, not the Egyptians, they stole it from the Babylonians and put it into their... Uh, their Genesis account. But then, interestingly enough, more recently, a, another cuneiform tablet has been found in the region of Babylonia called the Nipper Tablet. Now, the Nipper Tablet is older yet. It goes back uh, quite some hundreds of years before the Gilgamesh Tablet, and this, it's a briefer, more brief account, does not differ in any detail from the Bible, nor is anything added. Now, in archaeology, Okay, earlier accounts are always considered more accurate because over time things get embellished, right? They kind of 
uh, get a little bit more exaggerated. Uh, Pastor Nate, was that an eight-point buck you shot? Oh, no, 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 it was a 10-point buck. Okay, next year it'll be a 12-point buck, right? The pastor's not going to have me back after I get done picking on him here. It happens over generations. And so here we see that the earlier ones actually perfectly agree with the Bible. Well, the oldest civilization in the world is the Chinese, and the ancient Chinese have some really, really old books, like this Huan Azi, which tells how the former times the poles that supported the roof of the world were broken, the continents broke apart, and there was a great flood. They have a story called the Shu Jing story. And guys, this is 1000 B.C. I mean, that's the 3,000-year-old book. That's an old book, right? And it talks about a time when there was a flood. It came up over the hills, and it covered the mountains and drowned all living creatures. In the midst of this calamity, a hero named Nuwa appeared to replenish the earth. Isn't that an interesting name? But not only do we have these books, we have some scraps, some little bits, some information. Not full books, but, you know, some accounts that are just in, you know, raggedy pieces. Uh, and these are on even older, uh, that some think they're about 2500 BC. Wow, now we're talking about a 4,500 year old book. And, and they're in bronze and they're on bone. And so particularly this bronzeware and this oracle bone. And they have these characters. Now you understand uh, that Chinese is not written with letters. Chinese write pictures, it's pictographs, right? And they'll combine multiple pictographs, smaller words to get a more complex word. And so we can glean knowledge, even though we don't have the complete account, we just have these scraps and bits, but just looking at the words. Here is the old word for to build. It's a combination of several pictographs, a boat, a roof, and an announcement. That's to build. Now, why are they picking a boat? I mean, how many people build boats, right? Very interesting. The idea of making something really big involved a boat, a roof, an announcement. Here is an ancient, remember this may be different than the modern ones, but the ancient uh, sign for ship. It's a combination of a boat, the number eight, and the mouth, which is their way of saying a person. So you got eight people on a boat is a larger craft, a ship. You see these flood uh, analogies here. Uh, violent, the word for violent is you have the water stream, two hands, ejecting outwards all the way up to the sun. And uh, again, we have these references to the flood. Here is the word formally. We have a slight deviation between the oracle bone and the bronzeware. Uh, in the one, it's kind of got the water coming up, covering everything but the sun. In the other, the water coming, only showing the reflection of the sun. But the same idea, formerly, like in the old times, was this great catastrophe of a flood. Knowledge of Noah's flood in ancient Chinese characters. Well, as soon as you start talking seriously about Noah's ark, Noah's flood, in academic circles, you start getting questions. And here's the number one question I get is this. How did Noah possibly fit all those animals on his boat? Well, a wonderful book's been put out by John Wood Morappy, Noah's Ark, A Feasibility Study. And he makes a bunch of points in there, and I don't have time to get into it all, but just a couple things to think about. Number one, God brought them. And what's important to understand is he doesn't have to have every species. He has the kinds. Of course, God knows what the kinds are. So he didn't have to have all these kinds of cats. He doesn't have to have a lion and a cougar and a mountain lion and a jaguar and a cheetah. And, you know, it doesn't have to have all, get, by the way, naked cat, that's a thing, you know, or Siamese. He didn't have to have all that, just have two cats. It doesn't have to have a wolf and a coyote and a fox and dingo and you know, all these different varieties of dog. He's got two dogs. This idea of a kind is a really important thing. In fact, we see it stressed in Genesis chapter 1. It says, God made the beast of the earth after his kind, the cattle after their kind, everything that creeps on the earth after his kind. The earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. You think kind's kind of an important thing? Yes, an important part of our creation understanding. Number two, many did not need to come. Did we have to have goldfish bowls on the ark? No. Mom and Daddy Fishy went all over the world. They saw all kinds of things that they had never seen before. Number three, large animals could be taken as babies. People say, 
well, how is, Joe, how is, how is Noah going to get dinosaurs on the ark? These things are enormous. Well, A, remember God's in charge of this thing, but B, are you going to take the little baby ones or are you going to take the big grandpa ones? We're going to take the baby ones, right? They're easier to handle. They eat less food. They're going to live longer after the flood to have lots of offspring. And so some of these things, you just got to be smart about it. But yeah, taken as babies. Number four, provisions could be stored for those who do not hibernate. Do you know a lot of animals that don't hibernate as a rule can go into dormancy if climactic conditions get bad enough? That happens. And animals will go into dormancy. And so we don't know how many may have hibernated, but this Plenty of room because Noah's ark was huge, huge. Think about the size of a football field. And this thing doesn't need to have an engine room, doesn't even need to have a rudder to steer, it just has to float. It doesn't have to go anywhere. It's like a giant barge, it just has to float. Have any of you been to the Ark Encounter uh, in Kentucky, just outside of uh, Ohio? Yeah, I mean, this thing is a really great, you should go and see this. They've done a full-size ark, and it's just really a wonderful a display of the, the immensity of this ark. And they have a lot of the you know, possible technologies that might have been used on there. And it just helps the whole story become very vivid. Uh, great for uh, your parents and kids alike. Uh, I really can't improve much on the original analysis done by Morris and Whitcomb in their classic book, The Genesis Flood. They say there are 2.5 million macroscopic living creatures on the earth. 60% are aquatic. Of the 40% that are left, 70% are insects. There's only a few thousand kinds mostly smaller than a dog. The capacity of the ark was equivalent to 522 railroad stock cars. 73 such stock cars could have carried all these animal kinds. He had lots of room on the ark. Plenty of room for habitation for Noah and his family, for storage of food, and uh, even probably room for lots more people if they had wanted to come. Okay, we talked about a more reasonable faith. I'd like to jump into the Genesis record. And if you want, you can open your Bible to Genesis and kind of follow along. We're going to step through what the Bible has to say about the flood. And it's really surprising how detailed and how specific and how carefully this uh, really significant event in earth's history is laid out in God's Word. It's broken into three categories. First, the onslaught of the flood. Then the prevailing. Water's not going up. Water's not going down. It's just kind of set in there. And then finally, the abatement as the water begins to run off the continents and uh, the ark finally lands. But we see in Genesis chapter 7 the beginning or the onslaught of the flood. Genesis chapter 7 and verse 11 says this, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, notice how specific, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. Now according to that passage, what are the two sources of the flood water? Fountains of the great deep, and the windows of heaven, right? Well, let's start with that second one. What is the windows of heaven? Um, rain, but we don't know exactly. It's kind of an interesting phrase for it. It's almost like something opening up and being able to look out. Now, it could be, remember we talked about the possibility of this vapor canopy. The vapor canopy is just a theory, but it could be this is the point. Maybe a comet or something comes shooting in, and it whacks into this thing, and it causes the collapse of this water vapor canopy. And you have tumultuous rain, 40 days and 40 nights of tumultuous rain. We do have some very large impact craters on planet Earth, indicating that at some point in our past, don't know when exactly, but we're guessing probably around the flood, we had some massive asteroids that impacted upon this Earth. You know, the uh, evolutionists talk about maybe the Yucatan Peninsula that the, caused the dinosaurs to go extinct. There's even a bigger one in Australia, believe it or not. They, they ground penetrating radar, they've mapped it out. So there's these really big ones. And even one side of the moon really got whacked. It's just a lot of craters. You don't have erosion, you don't have the winds as much on the moon. Uh, so they've been preserved up there. And maybe this is also the time when uh, Earth got its wobble. So we have the Earth spinning around its axis, right? And kind of like a top that you got spinning really good and then you bump it, it'll still spin, but maybe it has a slight wobble to it. That's called a precession. And so we have this 23 and a half degree tilt, which gives our seasons, but we also have a slight wobble uh, that looks like the earth was struck. Maybe that happened then, don't know for sure. But one of the interesting things we see in the Bible is those ages that we talked about in our last session, people living uh, really unbelievably long periods of time, right around 900 years, 
all of a sudden they start dropping off exponentially after the flood. Could that be the loss of that water vapor canopy? Could it involve in genetics, maybe a bottleneck because you just got you know, one family trying to replenish the whole earth. Uh, maybe it's a combination of things. Uh, but the opening of the windows of heaven. Then we, we consider this fountains of the great deep. What's that talking about? Well, it would seem that under the plates, remember early earth, only one continent, there was this water that was under pressure. We read about a river coming out of the Garden of Eden. It never says it came in. So maybe this is subterranean water that's kind of bubbling up. Think, you know, Old Faithful, uh, the famous geyser there in Yellowstone, but just springs bubbling up and, and cut with such force that it makes these rivers coming out of the Garden of Eden. And of course, if you had no rain till the flood, well, you know, how are you going to get rivers? So uh, subterranean water. And at this point, maybe because those asteroids, those comets are slamming into the earth, maybe that's where it sets this all off. And so this water comes shooting out. And it would just be a really scary time to be on planet Earth. Water exploding out with great violence, carrying dirt and debris and even rocks high up into the atmosphere. And that's going to provide most of the floodwaters is going to come from these fountains of the great deep. Uh, here's a little uh, kind of clip to kind of give you a, a feel for how this might be. A little bit scary to have these uh, subterranean chambers bursting open and, uh, and causing this, this flood water. But it would be a terrifying time to be alive there on planet Earth. So the onslaught of the flood. Scientifically, a lot of interesting things. You not only got the continents now starting to move apart, Pangea is broken up, but you also have these uh, sediments being carried aloft, dirty rain coming down elsewhere as they come back down to Earth. And then extensive volcanic eruptions and earthquake activity. Again, as these plates are moving apart, this, things are just going haywire all over the place. And you've got lava plumes, you've got uh, earthquake activity that are going off. And of course, as earthquakes are happening, especially in the oceans, it's creating these massive waves, tsunamis. And these tsunamis are going to start carrying debris with them. And so as they begin to carry debris and start moving across the ocean, the first creatures that are going to get buried and fossilized are going to be marine creatures, especially lots of clams. I've got some fossilized clams here. These are kind of cool. Come take a peek at these afterwards. But if you look at the fossil record, from a satellite high visibility perspective, 95% of all of our fossils in all our museums and all over the world are shellfish. 95% are shellfish. 95% of what's left are algae or plant fossils. Only one one hundredth of a percent are vertebrates. And, and those are mostly fish. That's the big picture of the fossil record. The fossil record is best understood as a marine cataclysm. And so you have all these invertebrates, all these clams and oysters and shellfish. Now what's fascinating is they're fossilized closed. And these samples that I have here are, are fossilized closed. Now why is that significant? We all live in the New England region here. We like our clams, oysters, right? What happens when you cook a clam? It's just the muscle, right? So it relaxes and it opens up so you can grab it and stick it in some butter and eat it. So what's it telling you when they're all fossilized closed? They were fossilized alive. They died from fossilization. They never had time to open up. And we see these on tops of all the mountains. Even Mount Everest has these fossilized clams on them. Then in Genesis chapter 7, verse 19, we read, the waters prevailed upon the earth and the high hills that were under the whole of heaven were covered. Now the waters are coming up onto the land, not just covering, you know, ocean creatures, but starting to cover land creatures. And maybe at this point we have the ark starting to float up, but these massive waves coming up onto the continents, starting with the low-lying areas, the swamps are going to get covered and you start getting tremendous amounts of erosion that are happening. And you got these creatures that are, that are buried above the invertebrates and it's swamp creatures. Well, what's living in swamps? Somebody give me an example of a swamp creature. Snakes, crocodiles. You're forgetting my favorites. Frogs, well, yeah, you got some amphibians in there. Dinosaurs, thank you very much. My buddies are dinosaurs, right? And so on the higher levels, you're, or above the levels of the invertebrates, you're going to get things like reptiles. Okay, and, and that's 
And that's because they're living at a higher level as the waters are coming up and some of them are getting brought down on top of the, the already buried invertebrates. And then we have these debris pools as the erosion starts to build up and starts to bring things down from the high levels. And you've seen this maybe in the springtime when the water's running off really high and it's bringing down a bunch of stuff with it. Some of it's just leaves and sticks, but maybe it's an old empty Coke can or maybe it's some other stuff and it's just bringing flotsam and jetsam down with it. And then when the water slows a little bit, it just kind of swirls around and that stuff kind of falls there and it ends up being debris pools. Then we read this in Genesis 7 verse 20, 15 Cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. You have this progression, and now the mountains. By the way, why 15 cubits of water? God's got all these things under control. We can't take God out of this equation. The ark was 30 cubits high. So if it's setting down 15 cubits in the water, God wanted to make sure it could clear the highest mountain. Not going to run aground anywhere during this time. And so the ark's meandering around the earth, just kind of floating where it will. And so, again, God has all these things in control. Masses of vegetation are carried down, and now they're being buried by dirt as these rising floodwaters come up. They cover the high mountains, and even the larger, more mobile creatures that had the intelligence to try to run and get up in the high country, now they're being caught and buried, uh, oftentimes being uh, carried down by waves and buried in debris. Now, I talked about these debris pools. We see a very significant feature of the fossil record is fossil graveyards. What's a fossil graveyard? Well, it's a whole bunch of stuff that's just pushed all together one place. Kind of like if a kid is playing with Legos and mom says, can you put your Legos away and help me set the table? And the kid says, okay, and takes his arm and goes, and all the Legos end up in a big heap at the end of the table. Fossil graveyards. 25 dinosaurs have been discovered mixed in with 200 skulls of mammals. The Gobi Desert of Central Asia is a paradise for paleontologists. Freshly exposed skeletons sometimes look more like the recent remains of a carcass than an 80 million year old fossil. Well, I've got news for Michael Novacek. Maybe it's because it's not an 80 million year old fossil. Uh, maybe it is more recent. But here's some of these uh, Gobi Desert fossils, for example. You see saber-toothed tigers and crocodilians and dinosaurs. But they're all mixed together, all jumbled together, like all over on top of each other. In the Ashley phosphate beds of South Carolina, now they've been mined out now, but they had bits and pieces of all kinds of creatures. Uh, and they have records of this. And hadrosaurs, deers, plesiosaurs, dogs, iguanodons, sheep, woolly mammoths, all just jumbled together, bits and pieces of all these different creatures. Now, what's a plesiosaur? Does anybody know? Is that something that normally lives with a sheep? Plesiosaur is an ocean-going reptilian creature with flippers. What's that doing being buried along with deer and dogs and sheep? Iguanodon is a dinosaur. What are all these things doing being buried together? The flood explains it. Floods bringing these creatures in, in the big waves, and just burying them, picking up land animals, bringing them all together, and they all get buried. Here is a picture of a fossil graveyard. This phenomenon is so common that major museums show displays of fossil graveyards. Because that's what the paleontologists find. There's nothing, 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 nothing for miles. And then all of a sudden, boom, in this one area, it is full of fossils. Like everywhere you dig is fossils all on top of each other, kind of conglomerated. Look at this. Everything you see there is bone. Just jammed on top of each other. You go to Harvard Museum in Boston, you're going to see it. Go to the Carnegie Museum, you're going to see it. The, the, these museums, they show fossil graveyards. And then the Bible says in Genesis chapter 7, verse 24, and the water prevailed upon the earth 150 days. So now we're switching from the onslaught of the flood to the prevailing of the flood. Prevailing. And this is kind of important. It's kind of boring as far as you know, the ark is concerned. The, the waters are just kind of going. The ark's floating up. It's floating down. It's going up. It's going down. Okay, God, when are we going to be done with this? I mean, how many times can you play tiddlywinks with Shem, Ham, and Japheth, right? Tremendous amounts of pressure, and in some cases heat, are transforming these freshly buried organisms into fossils. Extensive coal and oil deposits are being created, the fossil fuels. 
And then we have this regular tidal flow because the moon is kind of going around and around and around. And so the, the tidal waves are kind of picking up some sediments and they're kind of laying it down. And we have these places where there's lots of fine layer, lots of laminite just kind of on top of each other. We see this in some of these uh, geological layers. And so you say, Dino Dave, are you really saying that within that one year of the flood, you're making all these fossils and even fossil fuels? That's what I'm saying. You see, we buy into this idea that it takes a long time to make a fossil. It doesn't. It doesn't. In fact, sometimes it just can't. For example, here is a fish fossil. Look how well this is preserved. Even to the extent that the eye is preserved. And the people that discovered this fossil were so surprised, they said the fossilization process was probably just taking a few hours, no more than a few days. It has to be that fast because otherwise it's not going to preserve all these fine tissue like that, in that kind of detail. Well, what about fossil fuels? Can that happen that quickly? Well, let's talk about coal for just a minute here. Here's a coal seam. This is the biggest coal seam in the world. It's called the Powder River Basin. You got 20,000 square miles of pure bituminous coal. This coal seam is about 200 feet thick. There's 240 billion tons of coal there in Montana and Wyoming. Now, can you explain to me, using the processes that we see on the earth today, how that was formed? You just can't form that slow and gradual. There's no way. Evolution say, well, maybe there's a huge swamp and all this vegetable matter is going to the bottom. It's accumulating down there. But my friends, lots of other things would accumulate. You'd have trees. You'd have fossils of creatures. You'd have, you know, over the millions of years, you'd have uh, volcanoes going off. You'd have lava. But this is just pure Black coal, an enormous amount of vegetation must have been carried there and all buried at once, pressurized and turned to coal. Well, how about oil? Don't we have to drill way down to get the oil and doesn't that take millions of years to form? No. No, we believe oil was largely formed through marine algae and engineers working at the U.S. Department of Energy at the Pacific Northwest National Lab were able to transform harvested marine algae into crude oil in less than one hour. It doesn't take lots of time. It takes the right conditions, lots of heat and lots of pressure, and it can happen quickly, very quickly. Let me tell you a story. I'm going to tell you a story about the nautiloids. The nautiloids is kind of bashful looking guy in the party hat there. And the nautiloids are creatures that we believe to have gone extinct. And at one time, if you would have gone to the Grand Canyon, they would have said, monoloids exist in the Grand Canyon, but they're very rare. You have to look for them because they're, they're rare, they're hard to find. Well, a guy by the name of Steve Austin, he was a creationist, was studying the Grand Canyon. And his idea was the Grand Canyon happened quickly after Noah's flood. It happened very quickly, got cut out. And the evolutionist said, there's no way. Look at these huge rock layers. It would take a long time for those to accumulate. There's no way that's happening in a flood because they believe that the limestone is like crushed up seashells. They get all that lime and lots of years of seashells kind of landing on the bottom of a great sea and kind of accumulating to form the Redwall limestone. And so Steve Austin is there and he's studying it and he's studying out the Redwall limestone trying to understand what's going on. Is this a slow and gradual deposition in a tranquil sea like the evolutionists say? Or is there something else going on? And as he begins to go up and down the river in his raft, studying the Redwall limestone, wherever he finds it, he begins to find nautiloids. Now, they're not as obvious as what this one is right here, this kind of you know, cigar-shaped fella kind of sticking out like that. Rather, they're just a circle. And the reason why is it's coming out towards you, and the canyon has cut the nautiloid. You follow me? And so if you were to dig into the rock, you'd see the cigar-shaped thing going back in. It's coming directly out at you. Once you know what you're looking for, there's these little circles all over. There are billions of nautiloids in the Grand Canyon. It was a mass kill event. Now, all of a sudden, there's no way you're going to do this with slow and gradual. And the story gets even better. As he began to research it, Steve Austin found there was a preferred orientation to these things. They're all facing the same direction. Well, that happens when there's a moving current and aligns things like this. And so all these things were buried within one vast, huge submarine landslide. And they actually brought Steve Austin in to educate 
the park rangers on the nautiloids. So now if you go, they have a whole different story. Well, it's not slow and gradual. It had to be a major catastrophe. Well, then we read in Genesis chapter 8 that God remembered Noah and every living thing in the cattle that were with him in the ark, and God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters assuaged. The waters returned from off the earth continually, and after the end of 150 days, the waters were abated. Now, the second most common question that I get asked after how did Noah fit all the animals in the ark is this, where did all that water go? Where did all the water go? If you had water all over the, ar- all over the earth, what happened to it? Who knows the answer? Yes. Back underground. You're close. I wouldn't say underground, but it did flow off into the deep ocean basins, and it's still there today. There's enough water in the deep ocean basins, in the midpoint of the oceans there, that if you were to have a huge, super enormous bulldozer and push the continents into the sea, we could have a mile and a half of water over the whole earth. You see what happens if you were to look, okay, we're up here near Boston, but if you were to look and say, okay, we start going off the sea, here's Cape Cod, right? We go out, it's gradual, gradual, and I mean way over your head, but still relatively gradual, 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 and then boom, it drops off there into this abysmal plain. You see that there? And you have these different abysmal, the Hatteras abysmal plain, these different abysmal plains. What's that? That was the drop-off at the end of the flood. Here, let me kind of highlight this for you. So when the oceans began to sink down and the waters began to run off, that was the original shoreline right there. You say, Dave, you sound pretty sure of that. Well, Psalm 104, go look it up sometime, is talking about the flood, and here's what it says. At thy rebuke they fled, at the voice of thy thunder they hasted away. They go up by the mountains, they go down by the valleys. Another way of translating that, The mountains rose up, the valley sank down. So basically, you start to have these fresh, you know, it's all brand new, you know, continental uh, ground. That cools off and it sinks down and the continents kind of bubble up and the water runs off into these deep ocean basins. Once again, some interesting scientific things are going on. We have the uplift of the mountains, the sinking of the ocean basins, erosion of those freshly laid sediments as the water runs off. We are freezing at the poles and higher elevations is starting to cause some glaciation to form. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 5, it says, The waters decreased continually until the 10th month. The 10th month and the first day of the month were the tops of the mountain seen. And of course, we know the story. Noah's Ark lands in the region of Ararat there. God provides this rainbow, a promise he's never going to destroy the earth with a flood again. And Noah lets all the animals off the ark. Now, Sometime after this, there's an ice age. There's one ice age. It's right after the flood. You take the conditions after the flood, warm oceans causing lots of evaporation, and you take all these volcanoes that are still spewing, kind of blocking the sunlight so the continents are cool. All this humidity is coming over the continents. It's beginning to rain, or in more cases, as you start getting it, snowing because of those cold continents, and the snow is building up. It's compacting down, and so we have this ice age. There's one ice age. It's happening within the next few centuries after the flood, and we know that it went all the way down as far as Kansas. And so there's this major ice age, a single ice age after the flood. Then eventually that water melts back again, and so what was once shoreline, not too far after the flood, uh, then the water levels come up, and uh, today it's continental shelf. Okay. So we talked about a more reasonable faith. We talked about the analysis of the Genesis flood record in the Bible. Let's wrap by talking about the scientific evidence for geological catastrophe. The scientific evidence for geological catastrophe. If we look at the rocks themselves and the fossils that they contain, we can tell slow and gradual does not work. It has to be catastrophic. So this idea of really slow millions of years forming the great geological processes, remember that third tenet on our creation model versus evolution model? You know, that's what we're talking about right now. Is it catastrophic in the past, or is it slow and gradual uniformitarianism? Okay, evidence number one is polystrate fossils. Polystrate fossils. Well, you can maybe gather from this word what it is. Poly is multiple straight strata, multiple rock layers. It's a fossil that goes through multiple rock layers, like 
this tree. It's a fossilized tree going through multiple rock layers here. Look at this one here. This is really a cool one. You got a 30 foot upright petrified tree, hundreds of these down in Cookville, Tennessee. The top and the bottom are in different layers. So the top is in limestone, permineralized. The bottom is coalified, and yet you have, it's one tree. Now you mean to tell me that that tree stood there for millions of years as one rock layer formed and then another rock layer formed, and it didn't rot? It just doesn't make sense. It, it just boggles the imagination how something like that could happen. But we don't only have just trees, we even have creatures. Here is a creature, a trilobite. It's kind of spidery looking ocean critter, and he's crawling along. I can imagine him, he's kind of doing this little trilobite thing, he's crawling along, and all of a sudden, a whole layer of mud gets carried in a wave and covers him up. And he says, oh my goodness, it's gonna be a bad day. And he works his way through this. He digs his way out of the mud. He starts scurrying along again. Another wave comes in and wham! Covers him with another layer of mud. He said, I told you it was going to be a bad day. He crawls through that, takes all the energy he can possibly muster. He starts walking again. Another layer comes in, wham! Covers him with mud and he dies. It's a bad day. And yet... Evolutionists want you to think that each of these layers is separated by millions of years. Look, at here's the fossil, and you can see the trilobite, and you can see he's kind of going down deeper, 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 and disappears into the lower layer. My friends, there's just no way this is happening fast. This is a catastrophe. Waves are coming in, and then another wave's coming in. Another wave, and the water levels are going up each time. Genesis flood. Here is... Dinosaur eggs. Sometimes we see dinosaur eggs and even track some part way in the flood. And so maybe a flood wave comes in and they're, they're swimming for a little bit and the flood water goes out and they're kind of like walking around and, and you have a pregnant dinosaurs. They're laying eggs and sometimes even as the, the waters are accumulating, look at this. Egg number one's at a lower level, two, three, four, five, six. The, 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 the sediment's accumulating while she's laying her eggs. Poly straight fossils. Number two, surface features. Things like raindrops and ripples and tracks. Does anybody have a pet? Some, some, some young person tell me about a pet. What, what, do you, what kind of pet you got there? You have a dog. What's your dog's name? What is it? Oh, Alice. Okay. Let's say Alice is out there running around after a big rainstorm and leaving mud tracks all through the yard. How long are those mud tracks going to be there? Are they going to be there for months and years? No, what's going to happen? Well, they're going to dry out and they'll crumble or maybe something will get blown across them. I mean, those tracks are going to disappear very quickly. The only way to preserve delicate features like raindrops and water ripples and tracks is if while they're still there, another layer comes across and buries them and preserves them. And that way they're not going to erode over time. And these have to harden then. And so sometimes as we begin to take layers off, we find in the layers things like ripples like this and lots of trackways, even dinosaur trackways in the western part of Massachusetts. I go to Holyoke or go down to the Hartford area there in Massachusetts and they've got parks where they have these dinosaur tracks, really cool surface features that are preserved. has to be layer upon layer happening quickly to preserve these things so that they're not eroded away. And then number three, conforming layers without biosoils. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of geological terminology here, but don't be scared. This is really simple. You guys are a smart crowd. You can get this. Conforming layers just means this. you got one layer that's flat. The next layer is going to be flat. Or it's got a slight curve. The next one's going to have a slight curve and so on. They're just kind of all going together. And so you see this sometimes. You, you can actually look where they blasted to put the road through. Just look at the sides of the highway. You're going to see layers like this conforming layers, strata. Uh, this particularly colorful one is from Argentina, but they're all over. They're all over here, all over New England, all over the world, right? Some of these mountains, you'd swear it was a giant birthday cake. Look at that. All these beautiful rock layers, right? Conforming layers. Now, how come they're all kind of facing that same direction? It's like they're you know, it's like they were very quickly laid down one on top of the other before there was a lot of time for there to be erosion or for soils. And you never see things like roots digging in. You never see burrows. You never see um, this normal bioturbation that would happen, even over you know, a couple centuries. Lots of this stuff would be broken up. You'd have gullies and ditches and little where rivers once flowed, right? You don't see that. You just see conforming layers. 
Rock upon rock upon rock upon rock. Clastic dikes, this is kind of a fun one. So let's think about our conforming layers for just a minute. And let's say that this layer here has some bubbles, maybe, or hollow spots in it. As the pressure pushes down, some of this layer is squirting up into those hollow spots. Now think about this with me for just a minute. If it's squirting up still, what's it telling you about that gray layer? It's still soft, right? There's no way it could squirt off if this thing has been millions of years and it's turned to solid rock. It's not going to do that. That's like toothpaste. Man, it's got to be soft to be able to squirt up like that. Now let's say some erosion happens, okay? And maybe these top layers get eroded off and all of a sudden you've got these weird things sticking up because the bottom layer was maybe a little bit more hard rock than the soft rock layers that were on top. And we have these things. They're called clastic dikes. Here's an example in Kodachrom uh, Basin State Park in Utah evidence the lower layers were still soft and squirted up. There's no way there's millions of years and these hardened to the next layer formed and those hardened to the next layer. No, no, they all were soft at the same time. Clastic dikes. And then my favorite is distinct layers that were bent together. Now follow me on this. Let's go back to our conforming layers. But let's say that something happens. Maybe there's a landslide or, or maybe a little earth tremor or something like this. And all of a sudden, these layers get bent. But notice they're all bending together. What is that telling you? They're all still soft. You're not going to tell me that this is 100 billion years old and that's a billion years old and that's 100 million years old and that's a million years old. This stuff wouldn't be bending like that. It would go snap, right? Check this out. Here is a whole mountain of bent layers. Can you show me somewhere on the face of the earth where something like this is happening today? I mean, this takes a catastrophe that boggles the imagination. Check this one out. Look at this. Look at those bent layers. There's a, can you see that guy up there by the fence post? Look at the size of that thing. I love this stuff. So cool. Fingerprints of Genesis flood in the rock layers. So what is the fossil record? I like what my friend Ken Ham says. It's billions of dead things buried in rock layers, laid down by water all over the earth. Basically, the whole fossil record is a gigantic monument to the Genesis flood. Well, let me talk about just a couple other things and we'll wrap this thing up. I want to talk about something kind of fun called out-of-place artifacts or ooparts. What on earth is an out-of-place artifact? Some guys were going around a waterfall uh, down in Texas and they found an interesting rock. And this rock, they saw something sticking out of it that looked like kind of a piece of wood. They thought, it's kind of strange to have a piece of wood sticking out of a rock. So they chiseled it open, and lo and behold, they found a hammer. And this is a, a copy. This is a replica of it. The original is down in a museum in Texas. But it would appear to be that this fossilized petrified handle and this uh, iron uh, hammer, kind of a finish hammer, if you will, is buried in a rock layer in a same rock layer that has dinosaur tracks and dinosaur remains. So you could call it a Cretaceous hammer. And of course we know there must have been a dinosaur making these. It's a Hammersaurus. We haven't found it yet, but they must be out there, right? An out-of-place artifact, an oopart. Let me tell you another one. Don't have a lot of these pre-flood artifacts, but here's another one. 1944, a guy named Newton Anderson, a young man. He's just a teenager at the time. His job was to keep the coal furnace, you know, just kind of keep the coal in there, keep it stoked, keep it going. And so he'd go down and bank the coal furnace a couple times a day. Well, one evening he's going down, it's kind of dark, and he didn't want to go down anymore that night, so he gets a big chunk of coal. He takes it over. He's getting ready to put it onto the furnace, and it kind of bobbles, and the piece of coal falls and breaks in half on the floor, and he sees something sticking out of one of these halves that looks kind of metallic. He says, huh, that's interesting. I'll put that aside, check it out tomorrow, puts the rest of the coal on the fire, goes upstairs. The next day he gets a, a, a croquet mallet, begins to whack at it, and extracts a bell out of this coal. Now you have to understand, this coal is Pennsylvanian coal that the evolutionists say is 290 million years old. This is older than the dinosaurs. And there's a bell in it. What on earth? An out-of-place artifact. 
Well, the story gets a little bit more interesting. John Morris was coming through doing talks on creationism at the time. John Morris, president of Institute of Creation Research, he's since passed away. But he was given the bell by Newton Anderson. Newton uh, let him, loaned it to him. He went to the University of Oklahoma. He had it analyzed, metallurgical analysis. Lo and behold, it's a bronze bell with an iron clapper. What's the clapper? It's a little thing that's inside that goes ding, 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 right? Bronze bell, iron clapper. Well, if you read in Genesis chapter 4, verse 22, it says, Zillah bears tubal cane and instructive every artificer in brass and iron. What are the two metals they use in the pre-flood world? Bronze and iron. What do you know? Here's a bronze bell with an iron clapper. And I heard about this and I thought, this is so amazing. I want to see this thing because I like to verify things. I don't want to just go by somebody's story. So I begin to make phone calls and I try to see if I couldn't find Newton Anderson. And, and I heard he lived in West Virginia, so I open up the phone book. This is years ago, goodness, before Google and all that stuff. Open up the phone book, and I, ooh, I, I made a phone call. I began to call every single Anderson in the state of West Virginia. It took me weeks. A lot of embarrassing phone calls. Couldn't find the guy. For good measure, I got the Virginia yellow pages and white pages as well. I went through every Anderson in those two. Still couldn't find him. I was doing a presentation in Indiana, and someone came up to me afterwards and said, hey, I knew Newton Anderson. He was my school teacher. He lives in Greenville, South Carolina, and goes to Hampton Park Baptist Church. Oh, my goodness, I know people there. So I made a phone call or two, and lo and behold, we located Newton Anderson. I said, do you still have the belly? He said, yes, I do. I said, well, can I come down and interview Make a long story short, I went down, interviewed the guy. I said, what are you going to do with this thing? He said, I don't know. He said, I've had Ripley's, believe it or not, want to buy it. I had a museum make me an offer. He said, but I don't want this to disappear in a museum, never be seen again. I said, well, listen, I do creation talks. I promise we'll use it. And I was able to buy the bell from Newton Anderson. And I brought it with me tonight. This is the original bell that was found in coal. Come take a look at this afterwards. It may be the only time in your life that you see a genuine pre-flood artifact. Whoever built this bell missed the boat. Please, look in a link. Don't touch it. Very rare, very special. Don't typically take it out with me. A pre-flood artifact. By the way, I had Newton Anderson take a polygraph test. I hired the best polygraph examiner in the Carolinas. Guy does death row cases. Came in, hooked him up all the equipment, asked him all the questions. Newton passed the test. I have a polygraph copy on my website. You can take a look at it. We have problematic footprints. This is a footprint that's stepping on a trilobite. It's supposed to be an index fossil for the Cambrian 600 million years ago. Here is a human footprint in Permian limestone. Again, we're talking about way before the dinosaurs even came around. You know, the fish are crawling up, and you've got amphibians at that time, not even the, the, the larger reptiles. And so we have these problematic things, these out-of-place artifacts. But let's kind of go back to how we started this thing. Let's talk about why it's such a big deal. Remember, the evolutionists are going to tell you that these are the layers, and you're going to typically find the invertebrates, and then you're going to find the fish, you're going to find reptiles, you're going to find the mammals and the birds at a higher level. And of course, they say it's because these evolved first and evolved to those, to those, to those, to those. That's their best evidence for evolution, right? How can we explain that? How can we explain this ordering? I've been on some paleontological digs. You go out, for example, in uh, the western part of the United States, and, and I was with this uh, paleontologist. He said, you can pretty much count on it. You're going to see these red layers. goes multiple states throughout the western United States. And these red layers are going to have reptiles. You're going to have phytosaurs. You're going to have these uh, dinosaurs in these red layers. And then you're above it, you're going to have the white layers. And the white layers, you're going to have things like the woolly mammoths. You're going to have things like mastodons. You're going to have you know, camels and things like this. The, they're always going to be separated this way. Why is that? Is that because one of all first? How do we explain something like that as creationists? Yes? The order in which they died. Remember as we were talking about the floodwaters coming up, the first things to get buried, ocean critters, invertebrates, eventually coming up on land and you got creatures that live in the swamps. So a lot of this is just habitat. See, that's where they live. And eventually you got the high ground, and these are getting washed down from the high ground. Maybe a wave coming in from the other side and putting them down upon this other layer where you had all these reptiles. 
And what's the last thing going to be buried in a flood? Birds, right? This makes perfect sense in a flood. And to some degree, maybe it's intelligence as well. Some of these are a little smarter. You know, something like this, he's just sitting there, duh, and gets buried, right? Whereas some of these guys, you know, they're a little smarter. They're going up to the high, especially the people, right? We don't have a lot of skeletons from, we really don't have any for sure pre-flood skeletons. So people are moving to the high ground and, and people are probably turning into fish bait. They're not buried in these lower levels. A guy by the name of Professor Emmy Clark, University of Illinois Urbane, he had this flume apparatus he designed. And you see these paddles and he would fill this thing with water. He had put in there some rather large stones, smaller stones, sand, and then even some really fine silt. And he'd stir this thing all up. He'd get the paddles moving on. Then he'd lift the paddles up and out and just let it slowly settle out. And moving current all by itself segments things into layers. Rock layers is a natural part of moving current. We have these whole uh, layers that might come. And you have, you know, the, the heavier rock. And then eventually you end up with the, the silt stone on top, the light stuff. And that's a whole sequence, a mega sequence. Then you have another whole mega sequence on top of it, which is a whole other wave moving in from another direction. But not only do evolutionists point to this layering, but another thing that evolutionists like to throw at creationists is specimen ridge. This was a big problem. For many years, we didn't have a good answer for this one. Evolution would say, well, look at specimen ridge. You've got these layers, and you have trees growing, and then you have another layer. Another forest grows, another layer, another forest grows. And there are literally 27 apparent forest layers buried in specimen ridge. And the evolutionists would laugh and say, you think a forest grew during the flood, and then that got buried. Another forest grew, and that got buried. Another forest grew, and that got buried. All within the one year of the flood? Well, we didn't have a good answer for that one. Put that in the back of your mind. We're going to come back and address that in just a second, because I want to take a minute to address the biggest, most significant geological icon of all, the Grand Canyon, the most famous geological formation on planet Earth. The Grand Canyon is actually a grand problem for evolutionists. How so? Well, the Grand Canyon is actually a mountain. That is, you have to go up, 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 up to the top, and you look down into the Grand Canyon. And so, for some reason, this Colorado River, which enters the Grand Canyon at 2,800 foot elevation, would have had to climb over 8,000 thousand foot elevation to erode out the canyon. Evolutionists want you to think that over millions of years, this Colorado River eroded this canyon out of this you know, massive plateau. And so how, how could that have done that? How could it have got, I mean, they don't. They pool up and go around. They don't climb over mountains and, and, and erode it away. Well, I'm going to suggest the Grand Canyon was formed by a flood in short order. Maybe just a few days. You see, the Grand Canyon represents a flood event where the water streamed down in and rapidly eroded away while it was still pretty soft as the waters were coming off the continents. So, Daniel, Dave, how is that even possible? The Grand Canyon in a few days? Well, let me tell you the story of Mount St. Helens. Here's Mount St. Helens, beautiful mountain. Below it is this gorgeous lake called Spirit Lake, but this is 1980. And on May 17th, 1980, something pretty radical happens. The mountain has a temper tantrum. It explodes. It blows its cork, and this whole side of the slope goes down into Spirit Lake. And so we have this massive landslide. We have lots of sediment beginning to move. we got trees getting blown over with the blast, getting carried down into the lake. And we have all this uh, the mud. We have lots of volcanic ash that's coming down out of there. And so all this stuff forms layers, mud and ash flowing down in the Spirit Lake. And it blocks the lake. It blocks the Toodle River, which comes out of Spirit Lake and kind of dams it up. And so over the weeks following, the water comes up, 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 up. So finally it crests the dam and all of a sudden, whoosh, it goes back the old course of the Toodle River and it forms a canyon. This canyon is 140 feet deep, 1,000 feet wide, and it's formed in minutes. And we might look at it and say, well, 
This looks like maybe it formed over millions of years, because look at these different rock layers, and maybe that year took certain millions of years to form, and that one maybe millions of years. And we see these layers, but we know what they were. It's, it's, it's this volcanic ash that's getting spewed out. It's the dust that's settling out. It's the landslide. We know what all these were, because we were there. We saw this strata forming. It doesn't take millions of years. It takes a catastrophe. One twenty-fifth scale model of the Grand Canyon right there, a fresh canyon formed at the base of Mount St. Helens. But the story gets a little more interesting because all these trees that were blown off the slope down into Mount St. Helens, there it is uh, on the north side, and all these logs are floating around in the lake. Well, look at the size of this, this, this log mat. And over time, the root side gets a little heavier, and you see these upright floating logs because the root ball's kind of carrying it down. Well, creationists are crazy creatures. Here are some creationists, Steve Austin and his buddy, and they say, well, let's check out what's going on. So they got some scuba gear. There they are in Spirit Lake. You see it's still smoking in the background there. And they're down there, they're taking pictures, and they're finding that these logs are getting completely waterlogged, and they're falling down in, and they're landing at the bottom. And then, of course, more dust and debris is settling out, and then more logs are settling out, and oh, now we understand what happened at Specimen Ridge in Yellowstone. So they went back to Specimen Ridge, and they begin to look at the tree rings at these higher trees and their stumps, and the ones at the bottom, all the tree rings match up. They all look at the same time. They're all falling out at different times during the flood when all those sediments are forming and dropping out. It explains it perfectly because of what we saw at Mount St. Helens. Now listen, folks, we're always going to have new challenges, always going to be new things to explain, but God has given us lots of evidence for our faith. Lots of evidence. But at the end of the day, it still takes faith, doesn't it? I would say it's much more reasonable faith than to believe that rocks came to life or a big bang created in the universe or complex biological systems assembled by accident. But it does take faith. Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now I want to wrap up by just going to the words of Jesus Christ for just a quick minute. Because this story of the flood is more than just a look into the past. Jesus says, when we think of the flood, we should also think about the future. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says, As the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days of Noah, these days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So we can look back at the events of Noah's life and the time of this great catastrophe, this flood, and we can learn a little bit about what's going to happen at the end of our age. Hey, do you know anybody that's all about eating and drinking and marrying and giving, just all about the things of this world? They're all about their job and making the money and having the nice house and the cars and having their family and doing all this stuff and traveling and vacating. They're about stuff down here, forgetting about God. And the fact that there's going to come an end to this age. And Jesus Christ is going to come again. It's the next thing on the prophetic calendar. While you look back at the Genesis flood account, one thing that kind of grabs me is Genesis chapter 7 and verse 16. And here it says, the Lord shut him in. When it came time for the flood, God says, get on board. And then his whole family gets on board and God says, okay, bam, and closes the door. Now, why couldn't God let Noah close the door? I mean, Noah probably had everything, the ropes there to kind of pull it up. Later on, he would open the door. Why did God do it? Yeah, God's seal. I think God was saying something. God said, you had your chance. Now, I'm closing the door. Now, watch this. Watch this. Hang with me. This is important. Luke 13, verse 25, Jesus says, When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door, and you begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he shall answer you and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. I would have to imagine at Noah's time, some of his cousins, some of his laborers that maybe he hired to help, they're coming running up the hill. They're saying, Noah, we believe you now. Let us on. Remember, there's plenty of room on board. Uh-uh. God shut the door. There's an opportunity, and then 
there's the end of the opportunity. That same thing's going to happen at the end of this age. And some of these knocking, these may be our friends, our lost loved ones, those that we work with, our neighbors, our work associates. Are we being faithful like Noah? You say, well, it's hard. I agree it's hard. Noah only saw his family safe. <laughs> That's tough, right? After about a century of preaching and, and you just got your family, it's the only ones coming to your church. No one wants to believe. But that's with God. It's our job to be on point, to be witnessing, to be sharing. Maybe you're here tonight or you're watching this live stream or, or looking at a YouTube video and you have never made your peace with God. Can I tell you, there's going to come a time where it's too late. That door doesn't stay open indefinitely. Jesus said, I am the way, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus is the door to safety. Jesus is our ark. We need to go in and get saved before the door's closed. Because there will come a time again where God closes the door on a whole generation. 